Hi. So I guess the uh, first thing is to explain what a, what a roadmap owner does. It's, it's a relatively new role in our organization. The idea in principle is to take a technology, look at um, where we are today, where have we come from, what, what's the level of maturity, and then really try and understand the value of that technology, and then set out a plan going forwards, much, much as ESRA have shown, yeah, a plan going forwards aligned with our company strategy for how we'll address that. So I'm going to try and give you a very brief overview. Um, firstly, to explain um, Airbus as a company, hopefully many of you are familiar with our company. Many of you may have come here on one of our products. Um, we're, we're one company, and we cover a wide range. So you'll be familiar with civil aircraft. We also uh, produce helicopters, military aircraft, um, satellites, uh, and, uh, and uh, other defense systems. So we're a pretty broad range of aerospace and defense products. In terms of additive manufacturing, I've tried to keep the scope fairly simple because I don't want to run over what everyone else has done. But according to the ASTM definition of additive manufacturing, you have seven categories. Our main focus of our portfolio today is around powder bed fusion, material extrusion, and directed energy deposition. It's not to say that we see no potential in the other streams. It's more that that's where the majority of our focus has been. And in fact, part of my job is to look at uh, where have we missed something, some emerging technology, which uh, we need to revisit um, in light of our strategy. So I guess with any uh, roadmap, it's, it's kind of useful to know where you are today and, and where you've come from to think forwards. So the first use of uh, sterolithography uh, in Airbus wind tunnel models was, was back in, I think, 1990. Uh, it seems to have disappeared from the side, 1996. Um, we applied polymers for the first time on serial products in helicopters back in 2003. So it's quite a long time ago uh, SLS was first applied. We then went a bit broader, and we started applying SLS, as many have done, in tooling applications. And all I'm showing on here is first. So I don't think we did it in 2006, and we've never done it since. This is the first time, and now these things are used uh, quite extensively. Also, back in 2006, we saw the first indication of what additive manufacturing can do um, in terms of risk mitigation for, for a big program. In fact, the value of being able to solve a problem in a program uh, can dramatically outweigh the cost of the solution. It's very much about how quickly can you do it and can you address the problem. And additive manufacturing has a lot to offer there. Um, around the same time, around 2007, I would say we started uh, seriously looking into metal additive manufacturing, hence I've shown the branch. And in 2011, we had our first uh, titanium part on a satellite uh, product. Um, structural part. By 2013, we'd also applied uh, SLM, so we had EBM, then SLM uh, titanium. And since then, on metals, we've also gone into aluminium products and been a bit more adventurous on satellites. So satellites are kind of our first push in being adventurous. Uh, we've done optimized RF components, filters, which uh, are launched, uh, been launched very recently, and also uh, optimized aluminium structures, very similar to what was shown by Thales, similar reasoning. Um, a lot of these structures on satellites are driven by thermal and by stiffness, basically, natural modes. So they lend themselves very well to big weight savings when you apply topology optimization. Um, in terms of civil aircraft, of course, we take a cautious approach. Um, but in fact, just recently, we announced uh, the first certified parts in titanium. You might notice that those parts are not uh, topology optimized. They're not that sexy. They're really a direct substitution of parts um, and there is a business case there. It's about recurring cost, saving on those parts. Those particular parts are very poor by to fly ratio. Therefore, we can see a cost saving. But it's a niche, and it's not the end goal. And I guess the point of this presentation is, is to lead you towards, well, what, what's the next steps, and what's our, our goal for that? On the polymers side, we had a bit of a, a, a lull. We, you know, we got SLS in. And we had some issues with the original polyamide materials with applying them for, for cabin, for example, because of fire smoke toxicity requirements. Um, when Ultem came on the market, we have then applied Ultem in a lot of applications recently on A350, partly risk mitigation activities and partly serial production parts now on that product. Um, and we see now with the material extrusion processes a, a branch of research into the composite side, so reinforcing those materials. And we see with the uh, selective laser sintering and other technologies that have evolved from that, more on the polymers, maybe not long fiber reinforced, but short fiber reinforced polymers. Um, and of course, uh, we're also looking into re directed energy deposition for, for the metal side, which is a branch off which I can't show you a first yet, but I hope we'll have a first within uh, the next couple of years. Oh, 
sorry, today. So from doing this work, we've been able to sit down and look at what is the value proposition and try and systematically think about what, what, what is additive manufacturing and, and why is it interesting. It's easy to get distracted by the sexiness of the technology, but in, as we see it, what does it do? It's a, it's a production process that gives you a near net shape product. So that gives you a low level of material use, which is good, or low level of material waste. Um, of course, if your raw material input is much more expensive, that's offsetting that somehow, and we have to take that into account. Um, it also can enable us to reduce assembly operations. It's been shown by several of the other speakers, which is, of course, an advantage. It's also a digital manufacturing process. It's a combination of the two. Normally, when we think net, near net shape products, we think tooling, and we think long lead times, and we think high non-recurring cost up front yeah, to enable that material cost saving downstream. With an additive process, we're basically taking the tooling out of the equation, or at least a lot of the tooling. I won't say all of it, but a lot of the tooling out of the equation. And that gives us a lot of advantages potentially in the future. We have reduced cycle time for iterations during development, reduced time for the first product from the design definition, um, reduction in tooling costs potentially, but of course taking the tooling away is also what really gives you the design freedom with AM. Yeah, that, that's fundamentally what's giving you the design freedom, is not having to worry about how are you going to access to remove tooling, how are you going to access to do machining, and so on. That gives us an impact on product cost, also on development time and cost, which is a, a much understated benefit of this technology, at least in, uh, let's say, non-prototyping application. And uh, it gives us that design freedom, the performance benefit. Um, a few of the exciter features, let's say, rapid solidification processing. So that's what gives us the ability to process some special materials. I think that's something that will take time. As Isra said, it's something we need to look at. Today, we're working really with old materials with a new process. And there are very few examples where people have really pushed the boundary on that. But that can be a performance enabler, a particularly a high, high temperature environment. And then the one that's not, has not been accessed very much yet, because it's a, it presents a huge number of challenges around the perimeter, is spatially graded materials. So the ability to use directed energy deposition to vary your material. And it doesn't have to be a dramatic change. We're not necessarily talking big chemistry changes, because that can lead you into a whole world of problems. But even quite subtle changes to the microstructure, to the chemistry, can have quite big uh, optimization potential in terms of the performance of a product. So that's kind of how we've broken down what, what is additive manufacturing when you ignore looking at the process and you think, what does it let you do? If we look at that in terms of the life cycle, what we've said is there's new product development, of course, is the early phase. And if you look at where we can use it there or where we already do use it, functional prototyping within the scope that we can access today with the technologies available. Addressing long lead time items, again, in the scope that we can access and ease of design evolution. So avoiding committing to tooling uh, until we really need to and until we have a stable design. If we go into serial production, we have also some of these low volume, high mix applications like mitigating supply disruption, um, which can be a real issue in an industrial system that goes for 15, 20 years. Suppliers can go bust, yeah? So factories can burn down. You have to address those issues on the fly while production needs to not be impacted. So that can be something that you can address. And in that serial production phase, that's really where we get into the exciter features of the technology. Optimized parts, so improving performance, looking at more integrated structures. Um, and, and that's where we can look at the design freedom of the technology. And then, of course, in service, we have repair. Sadly, products do get damaged, and sometimes they need specialized repair solutions. Spare parts, and also dealing, again, like supply disruption with supplier obsolescence. What you can see is that there's sort of, it, it, branches into two streams. You've got things that are low volume and high mix, where we're not so much focused on the design freedom of the technology. We consider on being unconstrained by the design constraints of the technology as much as possible, so we can address the existing product, minimize the amount of design effort that goes in to, to making that product work. And then we've got the more high volume applications, which is where the technology adds a value that competes it directly against the other solutions. And that's much more product cost and performance driven um, the, than the others. So we can kind of split that into three categories. Agile manufacturing, which we say covers the whole end-to-end -end of the product life cycle, but in different ways. Optimized parts, which is really what we're doing today, is looking at individual parts, what's the function of that part, same functional boundary, yeah, and then say, okay, can I do it better? 
but I think we need to go, as many others are, are doing, into more integrated architecture. So a little bit like the mission problem, step back and look at the whole picture and say, how does this affect our product and even the, the services that go around that product? Oh, apologies. So in terms of key enablers for agile manufacturing, as I said, it's not so much about design freedom and things like that. It's about lean manufacturing data preparation, taking the expert out of the process eventually so that you can really prepare manufacturing for the process without a bottleneck of needing an expert. That's really around software. It's around um, simulation tools and so on. Looking at uh, a lean process chain, People have talked about, you know, AM is just one bit of the process. There's pre and post processes. And in fact, the post process chain today for the certified parts is pretty long. Yeah, and that's because uh, we have to address the, um, let's say, the level of caution that we have to take at this stage. To be able to take that conservatism out, we have to do something. We have to prove that it's OK to take those steps out. And that requires effort and investment. But if, as long as we have these long process chains, often fragmented with no single supplier able to address the whole chain, we're going to have problems in terms of lead time. Process qualification, as mentioned, called different things to different companies, is very important as well. Um, if we have to perform a specific part qualification on every part, that is punishing us on lead time yeah, for, for, for being able to address some of these issues. We have used this technology in that way to solve some of the more severe issues that we face. But in fact, we could have a much broader scope of application with a solid process qualification. And the other one is material performance equivalence. So it's which products can you substitute with an AM product? And that's not about it being the same material, the same alloy. It's about the requirements that it satisfies. And in fact, we look much more to have materials in this frame that can cover the broadest range of other materials and envelope their properties so that we can um, minimize the amount of variance that we have to deal with in this uh, low volume, high mix environment. In terms of optimized parts, it, we, we need a lot of that stuff from the economics point of view, because we're still going to, when we go for optimized parts, we're still going to address the development phase, and we still want to do all that stuff quickly. But we really uh, we need more robust design for manufactured tools, because we're dealing with some quite um, complex designs, and often uh, that's leading us to more challenges in terms of how will we surface finish this part that has uh, inaccessible surfaces? How will we address support removal on this part? Th the more complex the design, the more difficult it becomes for the designer to see the, the, the challenges they're putting in front of them. Surface finishing methods are become increasingly important. Um, I think fatigue performance was mentioned before. It's heavily dependent on surface quality. If we're looking just purely at static applications or stiffness driven, not such a big issue. But when you work into fatigue environments, you need to really understand the effect of those surface finishing methods. And today, there's no one surface finishing process that can address all the different geometries that we face. Yeah? We have some processes that are excellent for cleaning out channels, but not very good at external surface finishing, and vice versa. And that means we need to address the fatigue performance of those different surface conditions. And that links to NDT. Because with NDT, surface condition can have an influence, and as can the geometry of the part. CT scan, I'm glad people mentioned it earlier, CT is often quoted as being like the holy grail, it will solve all your problems, but it has limitations as well. It has some pretty big limitations in terms of the total size of part and total thicknesses you can get a reasonable resolution of defect from, um, and the cost implications of that. So in process, NDT would be a, a goal that we would strive for because it takes away some of those constraints. Um, and of course, optimization for fatigue and damage tolerance. Today, we optimize really on the basis of static stiffness, effectively, mostly. Um, and when we get multi-load path structures, in fact, there's going to be a lot of methods and tools development needed on the FNDT side if we're going to address uh, applications that are fatigue critical. Oh, sorry. Um, and if we go towards more integrated architecture, um, there's additional challenges. What we're talking about more integrated is, of course, the bigger the box you put around your, um, your design problem, uh, the more you can address. So clearly process scale while maintaining resolution and productivity all in one, that, th those are challenging things. Today we tend to get scale 
and productivity, but we lose resolution. Yeah, you can draw it. I have the plots. Yeah, you can draw the relationship. Um, it's pretty clear. The question is how to push that Pareto front forwards, how to get into a position where we're getting the combination of scale, resolution, and productivity together. Um, that will enable us to go to these bigger parts. Intermediate processing will almost certainly be required if we're to go to real integration. What I mean is you generate problems for yourself in terms of areas that are impossible to access for your post-processing steps. And so you may need to consider a process where your part is produced in like loops, yeah, including post-processing steps in loops. That throws up a whole range of challenges. I'm not in any uh, denial about that. But unless we start to look at that and we have a plan to look at it, we'll, we'll never get there. NDT of large and complex parts, again, and particularly when you talk about non-destructive inspection of, of surface defects, which may be hidden from view. And then, of course, multi-material processes will open up the scope. If you draw a big box around a problem, but you limit the design to one material, uh, you limit dramatically what, what value you can, you can add to that. If you have the ability to look at multiple materials within that envelope, then you can address bigger problems. And that's really shooting, shooting for the moon, let's say. That's, that's, that's out there. So in terms of a, a very sort of a simple flow of, of the direction we're going, today we're targeting spares, niche serial parts where we can see a business case. It's really around ISO design. In the very near future, we're targeting the topology optimized parts, let's say for civil aircraft, so the higher volume applications. Within space, we're already doing it, so that, that's not an issue. Um, Looking further forward, we're looking at high deposition rate processes, initially looking at blanks, so production of blanks, fully machined, and so on. Initially, not addressing design freedom, literally looking at part substitution. But in the longer term, step by step, looking at taking advantage of the third dimension, yeah, which is typically constraining the designers today. If you're assembling a product out of things where you get plates in certain thicknesses, and if you design your thing to be milled out of a well, you have limits on the, the size of the plate you can get, but you also have big cost implications for, for going to those out-of-plane designs. And that leads us to the products we see today. We need the designers to revisit that, you revisit the whole design philosophy on the basis of these processes to be able to, to get there. And that's where we're going towards more integrated structures and systems. And then the new system architecture, I think, is where we, we, have, we really need the multi-materials capability to fully realize that. That's where we go from integrated structures to really a new system architecture. Thank you very much. <laughs>